Hi folks, welcome to Tuesday's edition of the iWrite Radio podcast, Stroke Videocast. Stuart Lockhead with me today. Hi there, Nori. Hi Stuart, um, and Nori Stuart, myself. Uh, we're going to cover the press conference today. Um, I have a word about Professor Curtis's latest offering, um, Social Attitudes Survey. Ah. Um, and I think furlough may get mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what was the other thing, Stu, you want to bring up? Have a quick, a quick word about the, what they call the Salmond Inquiry. Yes, the inquiry into the civil service handling of the Salmond Inquiry. It's now been dubbed by some people in the press the Sturgeon Inquiry for some reason. Well, that'll be the civil service inquiry about Nicola Sturgeon and Alex. <laughs> it's an inquiry into the civil service handling. Of the Salmon Affair. Of the Salmon Affair. There we go. Um, well, we'll kick off with a press conference. Um, and I think maybe we'll start with a clip of um, Mr. Jenwick. Robert Jenwick speaking to Kay Barley on Sky. So here's the clip and you can make up your own minds whether you think this is a definitive answer to the question, can Scotland get the same furlough terms as England? Or especially, do we have to wait for the south of England again? Yeah, so here we go. So was it a cast iron guarantee or not? Well, what we've said is that we will continue uh, to ensure the furlough scheme is UK wide. It was always UK wide from the start and we want it to be in the future. So if it's necessary to be deployed again, then that's a decision that the Chancellor uh, will have to make in the future. But everybody throughout the United Kingdom today can be assured that furlough at 80 percent will be available until the 2nd of December, which is important because of course, in England, we've got these further restrictions. There's further measures in place in the other devolved administrations as well. Yeah, what happens if it goes on past that, on um, past the 2nd of December in Scotland, and Nicola Sturgeon decides that she wants to keep the country in a lockdown past that date? Will they still get the furlough scheme? Uh, well, that's a, the decision the Chancellor will have to make at the time. But remember, at the moment, England is the, the, England is the that, only that, so part of the... Forgive me, Mr. Jenwick, forgive me, Rob Powell's coming up next, forgive me. But um, I, that, that the, seemed to be the promise that was made uh, yesterday by the Prime Minister. I'm just asking whether that was a cast iron guarantee or not. Well, well, I think what the Prime Minister said yesterday, excuse me for repeating myself, was that we'll continue to provide the financial support that Scotland needs so that Scottish people get the benefits of being part of the union that only being part of the union can provide, and that includes the furlough scheme, which is a UK-wide scheme. It will be available to everybody in the United Kingdom until the 2nd of December. Uh, at that point, I think the Chancellor, quite rightly, will have to decide uh, what its future is. So, there you are. Clear as mud. Clear as mud. Um, Richie Sunak now gets to dictate the decisions the Scottish government makes from his financial castle in the sky. The key point that the First Minister has stressed is that she cannot be held to financial restraints when she's dealing with a pandemic. Well, she can be, because this is politics. She this was has asked, nothing to do with the pandemic. She was asked by various journalists at today's presser, at least two, possibly three, what she would do if she didn't get this guarantee of the money, would it mean she wouldn't make the decision if necessary? And she said she would always put saving lives first. But she has to take into account, well, okay. In other words, I would make any decision necessary for the health of the nation, but I'm afraid businesses would go to the wall. Businesses might go to the wall. People might not, the compliance 
of social isolating might not be high enough to contain the virus because people wouldn't be happy about leaving work. Did she once mention the union and independence? No. Because no. Mr. Jenwick took, what, a third of his time to explain to us how um, Scotland couldn't manage financially without the help of England, because obviously Scotland can't borrow money. And if they were independent, they still wouldn't be able to borrow money because England would tell everybody not to loan them money. I, mm. I, I Are mean, you telling me that Denmark can't borrow money? Ireland no, no borrow not, money. not unless England says it's okay. Well, they're not allowed to borrow money. No, that. obviously not. I mean, Mr. Jenwick has this damn pat. Um, Scotland would not be able to uh, borrow money to pay for its own uh, furlough scheme if they were independent. Do you know that a local authority in the United Kingdom has got uh, more powerful borrowing rights than the government of Scotland? I'm not, uh, not sure that's true. Oh, that's always been true. Ever well, since the devolution. I mean, they, they borrow money to do all kinds of things. Uh, well, the, 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 the borrowing facility that the Scottish government got, has got is very limited. I think it's about 500 million pounds. No, it's gone up from that. It's well, about four billion. It's a full billion now. Uh, but it's very limited. Well, and circumstances like this, it's about as much use as a chocolate fire guard. I mean, it's the only use it's got is as a sort of fund for at the end of a financial year if the money's late coming through from Whitehall. Ha! That, isn't that happening every year now? Well, I'm just delighted that uh, Mr. Rishi Sunak as Chancellor will get to dictate the income level of the people of Scotland should we go into lockdown. See, the daft thing is, the, <laughs> the completely daft thing is, whatever the reasons, and they have a variety of reasons for not making this clear uh, in, in London, they keep, it's a grievance issue, and people in Scotland are switching to vote yes, steadily, have been for years, and this is just another reason for Scottish people to switch to vote yes for independence. Well, I mean, they could make it clear while Why maintaining, they? well, but they could do it while maintaining control. The trouble is, if they say yes, that it will appear that they are bending over the demands from Scotland, and yet they were firm with the mayor of Manchester. Well, I mean, the way they could do it is simply by saying, if Scotland chooses to go into full lockdown, the... Uh, with, they would have to hold discussions with the Treasury, but we can see no reason not to give them the same furlough conditions. And that would solve this immediate problem, the political problem. Um, but it would create, well, it, it would emphasize the fact that Scotland has to go cap in hand to the Chancellor to enact um, what they consider the policy they consider necessary to protect Scottish people. The only thing that the First Minister said that was political on the issue, she says it would appear that uh, it's not just uh, the devolved administrations that are suffering because of this current policy, whatever if it is a policy or just an accident, but also the north of England. Apparently, full support from the Treasury has not been offered until it became necessary for the south of England. Yeah, and somebody will catch on to that. I mean, it's been said, but the interesting thing for me is if Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland don't need to go into full lockdown and don't benefit from the furlough scheme, how are they going to keep it off Scotland's books when it comes to us paying interest on the UK borrowing, because this isn't going to go down as English borrowing. This is going to go down as British borrowing, UK borrowing. 
Well, it's like borrowing the money for HS2 and for London sewers and for this yeah. Crossrail and all the rest of these wonderful projects that they build in the south of England that apparently we get a benefit from here in Scotland. They are, they are known as, the Treasury makes this decision, they're known as national projects. They're seen as a benefit to the whole nation. Therefore, the whole nation pays the bill. So the sewers in London, Crossrail, as you've said, um, Henkley Point, the new oh, don't mention that nuclear power stations that are going to be built. Well, they're not being built. The will Chinese, be a national project. The Chinese that were building it on behalf of a French company that <laughs> EDF that's supposedly managing it have have pulled out. You haven't been watching closely enough, Stuart. There are three smaller projects that are on the books, one of which is just about to get the go-ahead. Oh, they've been working away at Hinkley Point in Somerset for donkey's years because well, it's such an expensive project. And the, the trouble is they've set, already signed a deal selling the electricity to the government, to the public, at such a high rate that we're going to be paying a fortune for electricity for years, but that's decades just to come. That's just one of them. There's another three smaller projects, nuclear power station projects. And do you know they've got the cheek to call them low carbon? Um, well, they're low carbon in production. Yeah, only at production, but not um, in disposal of the waste. Uh, what disposal of waste? Oh, oh, oh you mean what? You mean storage <laughs> of waste. Well, but it's, it's okay, because there's a lot of granite in Scotland. So there's no carbon footprint for getting rid of nuclear waste? Um, I'm sure there will be, but they won't ever get rid of it. It's down to our great-grandchildren to deal well, with. Well, I think you might find it's a few more generations beyond that. Um, but, but the point about this is that the, the, grieven the grievance monkeys will have peanuts forever from this furlough thing. Oh, yes, that's true. You know, it wasn't the only, the only, the only I mean, it was the key issue for today's press. I mean, without, uh, more than half the journalists asked questions about it. There were one or two other high points. Um, what the, the facts, the data itself, the number of fresh um, infections has kind of plateaued. 999. However, the, per the percentage of tests has gone up slightly, so that nobody's waving flags yet. But, uh, no, no. She, did, she was able to say that um, the level of infection is lower than the rest of the UK here in Scotland at the moment, but that doesn't mean to say it's going to stay that way. No, and she did emphasise the fact that everything was still very precarious. You notice Tom Gordon had a wee uh, headline generating question for us. He likes to do that. Uh, there's always one hack. Basically, the question was, I'm not going to go too precisely, it was worded because he probably had his headline already written. He referenced it, uh, apparently that delayed discharges, which is people stuck in hospital not being sent home or more commonly into care homes, which is an issue not in inseparable from the scandal about care home deaths because of the virus. So the guy linked it together, suggested that uh, we'd, given that uh, we now have problems with delayed discharges and uh, would they, would she have a different policy now? Bearing in mind what they know about delayed uh, di discharges from hospitals into care homes by patients with COVID. This, this is, we are just going to ignore the three lots of research that said, that have said that there is no proof that they can find statistically that discharges from hospital led to the deaths in care homes. This, this is because it's counterintuitive. I think we all thought that discharge from hospitals must have had something to do with the infection rate in care homes. I, I, I mean, I thought that, but 
it appears that there is no way to prove that. I most think it's likely, the most... Well, the, the only statistic to find so far was that large care homes had a lot more deaths than small. Yeah, yeah. And I, I actually think that care home owners know damn fine what caused this. And, and they're, they're terrified because they're not insured for being sued. Yeah, and and the, 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 the principal cause looks like it was staff being moved around from care home to care home. That's not yet been, um, well, if there is research on it, it's not been published yet. So that'll be interesting. Um, the other one, the other question that caught my eye was also caught your eye. Um, and possibly Ofcom's eye. Yes, possibly Ofcom. Um, See, good well, listeners and viewers, Nori and I worked at, in, a, in a, an official radio station. And so we have some experience of Ofcom rules about what you can and can't do if you've got a license. And today, BBC Radio News, the lunchtime news, came on to ask a question from the First Minister live on air. It's called an ambush. And uh, they didn't alert the First Minister that they were going to do so. She just had alerted her once they were on air so that it was being broadcast live. Now, you can't do that. You end up, you'll get reprimanded even if you're the BBC by Ofcan. You've got a notice telling you not to do it again. But it's, Well, uh, somebody has to complain. Oh, I'll complain. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll make the complaint. So, and, and the question was one of those... Mrs. McGumphy, for Alter Arder, has, has just somebody been... Somebody died? How bad can this be? How well, messy was this question? But it was, it, was, it was a question nobody could have answered, even the person's doctor, because the claim from the caller was that their relative was in a bed beside somebody with COVID in a hospital. Their relative got COVID and died. Now, how can you, who can, you know, how dare they do that? I can well, make it up. You can't prove that the relative didn't have it when they came into hospital, that the relative didn't catch it off one of the staff. You know, the, you can't definitively say it came from the person in the bed beside them. But the question was, what are you going to do about it? It's going to be a rocket coming from the Scottish government to the BBC about that. That was appalling behaviour. You wouldn't get away with that on talk radio. Well, that was even better than Ruth Davidson's usual. Mrs. Smith, who was sitting in the gallery, lost both her hands trying to lift up her Conservative Party money. What are you going to do about it? Mrs. McGumphy. Um, well, the presser, as usual, threw up some good questions. Yeah, well, I mean, I've, got, some I've, got, I've questions. got a quote from the First Minister that I've got to give you, right? What was it? She asked, she asked various questions. Only a fool rules out anything in a pandemic. What the quote was that about lockdown? Would you go into lockdown in order to access the furlough money? Basically, yeah. Would you yeah. would you change your decision about let's say Lanarkshire going into level th four, which was a virtual lockdown, if uh, just to get the money before the end of uh, November. Well, that that is, of course, the next thing they're going to have to do. They're going to have to come up. If if Sunak decides that furlough money can be paid out in different nations at different times on a lockdown, they're going to have to come up with a definition of lockdown. There you go. <laughs> and that definition could be dictated by Conservative Party policy. What, for instance, if they were to turn around and say it's not a lockdown unless schools are open? Because both the Welsh government and the Irish government extended the holidays to keep schools closed during their fire break, as the Welsh call it. Don't forget, they're under a lot of pressure. The further south you go, the more pressure they've got from um, lockdown sceptics. Look at Nigel Farage. He's now launched a new, another no. new party called the Reform Party, Anti-Lockdown Party. I hope he's got, uh, I hope he's managed to uh, buy the rights to the name 
this time round. You got it wrong the last time. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed this. I caught it in the, he'd, he'd started a new party. I had no idea it was an anti-lockdown party. Yes, that's the, that's the main policy. It's an anti-lockdown party, and it's called it something called the Reform Party. But as led by donkeys, those wonderful people who come up with the fabulous videos, they seem to think uh, they, they've, they've asked Nigel Farage, have you actually bought <laughs> the rights to the name of this party this time around? Because the last time they didn't own it. Led by, uh, what was it? Basically the Brexit party, they called it. And they didn't own the name. Um, I just, I mean, how can you be anti-lockdown? How can you even do that? Well, these are all the man, all these people that go on these rallies and the masks, anti-masks, and they don't, they're complete climate den deniers, you know, David Icke fans, uh, reptiles, they put, you know, people that think reptiles live inside human bodies and stuff. Well, I, but I mean, is there no circumstances under which these people would accept a lockdown? You know, they, they should, the law should state, if you're anti-lockdown, you have to have rallies without face masks in COVID wards. I don't think they realise this in this country just what strict, how strict the rules are can be in other countries. I mean, people wouldn't assume that in Australia that they're run by, a you know, some kind of Nazi government. But if you, they both encourage you to self-isolate by giving you $450 straight away if you have to self-isolate. Um, the, the testing is free and it's done within the hour if you've got a sniffle. Um, the, the fines are enormous, $10,000 suddenly very quickly if you break wow. a quarantine. Dear me, no idea in this, how, how they're getting away with it in this country. Well, there was definitely a, a whiff of that floating about, um, about how you force people to self-isolate. Uh, I can't remember who asked the question. Anyway, enough of that. Let's move on to Professor Curtis. Mr. Curtis, let me see if I can find his paper. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to read his, the whole paper, but I think we can sum up quite quickly. What did you call the survey? The social social attitude survey. It's a. This has been going on since 1999. They do it every year. They ask the same questions every year. And uh, the surveying was done. The last person asked the question on this survey was done before the COVID pandemic started. So, the results of this have got nothing to do with COVID. And yet, what do we find, Nori? Well, the uh, support for uh, independence is over 50%, according to it. And the, the thrust of it is that it looks like it's mostly driven by Brexit. Mm. Um, but the most interesting thing is the confidence in the Scottish government, an independent Scottish government, to run the Scottish economy is what was it 67 percent something um, like that they actually asked people if they want a choice they gave them a choice of three questions independence devolution as it is or no parliament so they could have had no parliament or devolution 51 percent that 51 percent wanted independence so there was only 49 percent wanted devolution or no parliament well, the, the interesting thing is that now it now appears the union's job is to convince them that the status quo uh, economically um, is better than a, a future independent Scotland. And they've got a mountain to climb to do it, if, if it's accurate. We discovered that on balance, voters are more likely to say that Scotland's economy would be better, 43%, as a result of independence than they would, than they are to say that it would be worse, 33%. A reversal of the position prior to the 2014 independence oh, referendum. Sorry. I'm sorry, I gave you wrong figures then. I misread that. All right, sorry. So 
43, this is, all this is before Brexit, 43% said uh, the Scotland's economy would be better as a result of independence. They say it would be worse, uh, whereas they said it, it was 33% back at the 2014 referendum. So people have now moved. But the, the, what was the percentage of people who thought it would be worse? Because they asked that question. Oh, they, no, the 61% thought it would be worse off. Ah, after, after so, independence. Yeah, so, you're, no, so you're, putting, you're putting your... Wait a minute, in contrast, voters are more than three times as likely to think that Brexit would leave Britain's economy worse off, 61%. Yeah. And so, uh, the, the, it's all about the economy. Just over half, fifty-four percent, believe that independence would result in Scotland having a stronger voice in the world. A half believe that Brexit would leave Britain with less influence in the world. So, well, I mean, the basic story is there are more people think independence would be a good idea from more directions than previously, and that was before. Um, Nicola Sturgeon surge in the polls as a competent leader due to the pandemic. And the key issue is the, is the question of the economy. And the question of the economy is important because it's a question of people, a lot of people made the decision, especially to say no on the question of risk. Risk being, it's risky, this step into the unknown, this independence. What would an independent Scotland look like? compared to what we've got so that's too risky but now people are starting to think it's too risky to stay with this crazy britain well i i think we should mention this was really about an independent scotland being in europe yes that's true it's very much the brexiteers uh not the brexiteers very much the remainers yeah yeah that have moved i don't want to drill down into the details of the people who uh, moved to yes, but, but it's certainly about twice as many people moved to yes from the Remainers voters and the Brexit referendum than voted leave and moved to no. Yeah, but anyway, it's all good news. Um, I think we can move on to uh, your report from the inquiry into the civil service handling of the inquiry into Alex Salmond. Oh, it's very difficult to come up with a catchy title that doesn't involve either the Salmond word or the Sturgeon word. The shorthand up to now has been the Salmond inquiry, but it's really not about Alex Salmond. It's about, as you say, it's about the way the civil service and the first minister dealt with it. So some journalists have decided to call it the Sturgeon inquiry. Mm. Who am I to it was i i was addicted to it this morning again trouble is we've got other things to do we want to be a prayer a show and talk to people about other things in the world so i gave up at quarter past 11 but i watched it was fascinated they had a guy called paul cacket who's uh legal um a legal man the short version is he was asked a number of questions key it was all about who knew what about the it was about the judicial review that threw out the government case in fact the government actually collapsed their case rather than have losing uh, the, the judicial review and that was based on the fact that they'd appointed someone to do an inquiry into the possible behavior, possible bad behavior of the previous first minister, who was already involved before the complaint was made. In other words, what, what we would call a fishing expedition. And um, <sighs> that's what I would call it. Anyway, the, the, the fellow involved, what was interesting was his, he mentioned that the Lord Advocate was mentioned two or three times. And every time that, you know, the, the, these civil servants are on tricky ground. They're allowed not to answer questions about certain people. I didn't realize that the, what, when he, every time the Lord Advocate's name was mentioned, this man would start 
picking up his glass of water and mumbling and things. He got very nervous each time. So I don't know why the Lord Advocate uh, is so important. There he is, Lord Advocate, nervous. Is well, is he worried that he says something that implicates the Lord Advocate in I the decision? Know. There must be rules in the civil service. I'll tell you something else we discovered this morning. You know the complaints that were made by these women, and they were thrown out by a, the judicial review, and they were thrown out in a criminal court. They're still active. The complaints still not at rest. In other words, they could be brought back in in the future. Presumably well, with a diff different inquiry officer. I mean, the, the complaints within the civil service were not the same complaints. They've, not, they? been, they've not been completed. Well, if the complaint, well, I suppose it's like civil and criminal law. I suppose there are different what shall we say, thresholds of proof required. I made a point of taking down what the legal, it was a legal guy, Paul Caquette. He said, the complaints are still not at rest, was the, the legal expression he used. So they're still open. Well, that would be kind of interesting if they run a complaint through that is identical to one of the complaints that was made in, in the courts, in the law courts. I will up what of course you go back from especially criminal courts if you have to go backwards from that. I mean that would be very difficult. But. Well, I mean that's a favorite trick in America. If they can't get a legal um result, they go to a civil court where the, th the threshold of proof is lower. Yeah, well they can do that in this country. The one other point that, uh, uh, that they were stressing this morning. They come up. They decided to come up with a policy, to, a stronger policy because of Me Too about harass, possible harassment, in particular of women, by powerful men. And the first, they went through. I don't know. I think I figure of maybe twenty iterations, twenty versions before they decided it was good enough to sign off. In other words, they'd write something up. They'd look at previous policies and they'd rewrite it to suit and rewrite it and, and look at the lawyer would look at it. Apparently the very first draft, the very first draft of the policy, the very first paragraph says that the investigating officer should not in any way be involved, have been involved with a complainer. Not the that, final version, the very first one. That That's the bit I don't get. How I do, not, the, I do they, not understand how Judith McKinnon, how anybody could have thought it was appropriate, reasonable for her, having had contact with the complainants previously, to be the investigating officer. That, to me, that just that's just stupid. And the other thing that this legal guy, Paul Cochette, let slip without meaning to but quite clearly because we what we found out was that the entire procedure of formulating this procedure <laughs> was being run from the permanent secretary's office it's entirely in her power well there you go so, so you, you'd like... have to turn around it's your responsibility permanent secretary Leslie Evans and Judith McKenna. And Ten how is she ago. still in her job? I don't know. And apparently she even got her contract extended by the First Minister. Did you know that? Um, possibly it was a way to keep her in the fold for this inquiry. That's not what you think, I know, but I possibly no it was. Um, I think we'll call it a day at that, Stu, eh? I'd just like to read out the headline of Mike Small's article. We don't need to go into it. I think the headline is, is fascinating. I don't know if you did. You read it? No. Why? It, 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 no, just the first paragraph. It says, Mike Small, why is the union so special? Apparently, that was the title of Douglas Ross's speech yesterday. It, it feels like a rhetorical question. It's not entirely clear where to put the emphasis. Is it why? Why is our union so special? Is it, why is our union so special? 
Oh, is it? Why is our union so special? Sorry, I, I could have put that better. Why is our union so special? Why is our union so special? Why <laughs> okay, is our stop, union so special? Um, and did he answer the question? No, no, no. He just gives a reason why, why it's not special. You know, poll tax, Thatcher isn't tried and... Uh, doesn't mention broad shoulders then, no. I don't think so, no. Well, I, as I say, I think we'll call it a day at that. Yep. Thanks for being with me, Stuart. Uh, and, uh, we're lucky we got away without a, another interruption. Uh, yes, this is our, our second attempt at a show, folks. We had uh, an interruption earlier, which you would have known nothing about if Stuart hadn't mentioned it. <laughs> hey, that just shows you how professional we are. Okay. Um, we'll catch you all tomorrow. Thank you for listening. And as I say, thanks for being here, Stuart. Cheers for now, folks. Yes, cheers.